Welcome everybody to Loose Moore Auditorium. I'm glad to see you all here. This is a lovely crowd. Um, Professor Lance Strait is going to be speaking to you on the binding biases of time from his book by the same name. It, there are going to be some copies of it outside the door if you're interested in taking a closer look. Um, this talk and Professor Strait's visit are being sponsored by the School of Communications and by the Communications Studies major and also by the Institute of General Semantics and you'll hear a little bit more about that. I'm going to turn over the balance of this introduction to Corey Anton, a colleague and friend, who is also a colleague and friend of Professor Strait. And so without further ado, here's Professor Anton. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here, and I want to begin by first thanking so many people who were involved in bringing uh, Dr. Strait here today. I do want to first acknowledge and thank Dr. Valerie Peterson, the area coordinator for the communication studies area. Uh, done a lot of work in bringing this uh, speaker here to us tonight. I also want to thank Dr. Uh, Danielle Leak for all that she has done in these arrangements. I know that she's also making her class available to Professor Strait tomorrow. I also want to thank uh, Professor Peter Zhang for hosting Dr. Strait tomorrow as well. And finally, I can't help but give a lot of thanks to Deb Barco for all that she has done in uh, making the various arrangements that have gone on in, in making this happen. I think I want to say just a really quick announcement and explanation of how we are able to bring Dr. Strait here this evening. Uh, if anyone has been on the second floor of Lake Superior Hall in 281, you can now notice that the Institute of General Semantics is housing an archival bookstore there and it's something that we inherited this summer and it's going to bring in a significant amount of funds to the communication studies area and we're really quite excited about that and I really should acknowledge Adam Burrell for all that he's done uh, in getting that housed and situated there. He's really been doing yeoman duty. Uh, some of the funds that this is going to provide, one would be an annual speaker series, and you can see this is the inaugural first speaker in that series, so we're really excited that Lance is here uh, to do that for us. It's also going to be providing, in the next year at least, the beginning of some internships, and including some paid internships, so people please uh, stay in touch with me if you're interested in learning more about that. And soon enough, and we'll be, we will be announcing this in the winter semester, but there will be a general semantics scholarship available to students. And what's really exciting about that is that Lance is the past executive director to the Institute of General Semantics, and his most recent book, which is called On the Binding Biases of Time, will be on that suggested reading list for those people who are interested in that scholarship. So it is exciting that he's here. We also, as uh, Dr. Peterson said, we have copies of the book available. Uh, limited supply, but we will do a little bit of a signing uh, afterward. And I guess with that said, I, I want to go into the formal introduction to tonight's speaker. He will talk for about an hour or an hour and 15 minutes, and then we're going to make time for questions afterward. And then after questions, again, there will be books available, uh, a limited supply for those, and he would be willing to sign those. Okay, so our speaker tonight, Dr. Lance Strait, was a communication major as an undergraduate at Cornell University. He then earned an MA in communication at Queens College and a PhD in media ecology from New York University. As a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University, of media studies at Fordham University, he is internationally recognized for his intellectual leadership in the discipline of communication. His scholarship is focused on the development of media ecology as a field of inquiry with special attention to the works of Marshall McLuhan, Walter Ong, and Neil Postman. The scope of his work is rather vast. It spans the historical relationship between modes of communication and social historical phenomena such as heroes, religion, nationalism, the city, the self, and consciousness, the impact of new technologies in digital media including online communications, the nature of media history and futurism, language and symbolic communication as it relates to media and technology, communication and autism, popular culture issues such as television, film, baseball, masculinity and alcohol, the sense of smell, science fiction and fantasy. It's a, quite a range of things he's, Lance has written on. Uh, he's one of the founders and the past presidents of the Media Ecology Association. He's also a past president of the New York State Communication Association. And as I mentioned before, he's the past executive director of the Institute of General Semantics. He is author, editor, and co-editor of many books. I'm just going to give you three here. Uh, one was in 2006 called Echoes and Reflections on Media Ecology as a Field of Study 
one that he uh, edited or co-edited with Ron Jackson and Stephanie Gibson, which is now in its second edition, is called Communication in Cyberspace, Social Interaction in an Electronic Environment. And one of his uh, less well-known books, but one that you really want to be familiar with, is one that he co-authored many years ago back in 1987 with Neil Postman, Christine Nystrom, and Charles Weingartner called Myths, Men, and Beer, an advertisement, an, an analysis of beer commercials on broadcast television. So without further ado, I give you Lance Strait. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Anton and Dr. Peterson. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, spend some time with you. And uh, well, uh, let me begin by noting that in uh, the book, A Brief History of Time, by Stephen Hawking. He writes that the universe started off with a bang about 13 or 14 billion years ago and it's continuing to expand today. That is, the Big Bang is an explosion so massive that it's still going on with no end in sight. The explosion is taking place on so vast a scale that we don't experience it as an explosion but we're all riding on the Big Bang, clinging to a tiny bit of debris that we call Earth. As our galaxy moves at a rate of 185 miles per second. Now, on the other hand, the Bible tells us that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And traditionally, we've looked to the cycles of nature for our sense of time. And we've tried to capture those cycles in turn in our calendars and our clocks. But we also have a sense of time as an irresistible forward motion. It was not until the 19th century that physicists established the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the universe has a statistical tendency to move towards a greater degree of entropy over time meaning that the passage of time is irreversible. This is sometimes referred to as time's arrow. But the notion of history as an unfolding progression dates back to antiquity. And no doubt our prehistoric ancestors understood the process of aging and the passages from birth to childhood to maturity to death. Marshall McLuhan talked about how we move into the future looking into a rear view mirror. That's an automobile metaphor, although it, it isn't exactly how a rear view mirror works, but then again, McLuhan never drove very much. But even if his metaphor is a bit askew, his point is quite valid, and that's that we tend to live in the past because that's all we know. We think of time as a line or a road that we're traveling on, moving forward into the future, but McLuhan reminds us that in actual experience, we can see nothing of the future that lies ahead, while the past is laid out clearly for our inspection. In this sense, then, we walk backwards into the future, which is a metaphor that's employed in some tribal cultures. Well, I, I could go on in this vein, but having neither world enough nor time, I must put an end to this meandering introduction and begin in earnest to, by reading to you from an essay that the mass communication theorist James W. Carey wrote about the Canadian economist and media ecologist and communication theorist Harold Innes. And so I quote now from uh, from Carey, Innes argued that changes in communication technology affected culture by altering the structure of interests, by changing the character of symbols, and by changing the nature of community. By a space-binding culture, he meant a culture whose predominant interest was in space, land as real estate, voyage, discovery, movement, expansion, empire, control. In the realm of symbols, he meant the growth of symbols and conceptions that supported those interests, the physics of space, the arts of navigation and civil engineering, the price system, the mathematics of tax collectors and bureaucracies, the entire realm of physical science, and the system of affectless rational symbols 
that facilitated those interests. In the realm of communities, he meant communities of space, communities that were not in place but in space, mobile, connected over vast distances by appropriate symbols, forms, and interests. Carey goes on, to space-binding cultures in as opposed time-binding cultures, cultures with interests in time, history, continuity, permanence, contraction, whose symbols were fiduciary, oral, mythopoetic, religious, ritualistic, and whose communities were rooted in place, intimate ties and a shared historical culture. As cultures became more time-binding, they became less space-binding and vice versa. The problem was found in dominant media of communication. Space-binding media were light and portable and permitted extension in space. Time-binding media were heavy and durable or, like the oral tradition, persistent and difficult to destroy. In propositional form, then, structures of consciousness paralleled structures of communication. Now, if any of you had encountered Carey's scholarship before, you'd know that he was, in fact, a leading expert on the work of Harold Innes. Uh, if any of you encountered Harold Innes's scholarship before, um, then you would have noticed something curious about what Carey had to say about him, uh, because as the title of Innes's book the bias of communication indicates, Innes argued that different modes of communication are characterized by different inherent biases, an idea that is foundational for the field of media ecology. But Carey, rather than using Innes's terms, which were space bias and time bias, speaks of space binding and time binding. It was a seemingly minor and harmless substitution, to be sure, except for the fact that the phrases space binding and time binding are established terms in the discipline of general semantics, having been introduced by Alfred Korzybski in his first book, Manhood of Humanity, which was published in 1921, and then included in his major work, Science and Sanity, which was published in 1933. Now, as far as I can tell, Innes didn't draw upon Korzybski at all, though it's reasonable to assume that Innes was aware of Korzybski's work, as most North American intellectuals were in the mid-20th century. A Carey doesn't make any reference to Korzybski in his writings, as far as I know, but I know that Carey was familiar with Korzybski's ideas and with his terminology, so in the end, I can't say whether Carey meant to draw a connection between Innes and Korzybski, or whether he substituted the terms purely for stylistic reasons, or whether he simply made a mistake. But that point of either conflation or confusion gave me the idea to draw on both of those terms and entitle my address, and ultimately the book, on the binding biases of time. And my intent is to capitalize on this confusion and to address that aspect of time tonight, at least as much as time permits. Now, Korzybski's concept of time binding is by no means a radical notion. It's the idea that human beings make progress from one generation to the next by virtue of our ability to preserve and accumulate knowledge. And nowadays, we've grown a bit uncomfortable with the word progress. So we're more likely to talk about, say, evolution in reference, for example, to cultural evolution. But if you really think about it, at least in this instance, evolution is used to a large extent as a euphemism for progress. At one time, the talk was of evolution to a higher state of being. More recently, we speak of evolution towards greater complexity. And I understand the need to avoid the triumphalism that was associated with the concept of progress in the early 20th century, but I also think our language has grown a bit poorer and less precise for having eliminated the word progress from our working vocabularies. Now, Korzybski used time binding as the basis of his definition of the human race as a unique 
form of life, a unique class of life, in contrast to animals, which he referred to as space binding, and plants, which he termed chemistry binding. His threefold schema can best be understood when we take into account the fact that Korzybski's background was in engineering. Now, engineers are concerned with pragmatic questions and practical concerns, with specific tasks uh, accomplished, with getting them accomplished, with work. From the point of view of physics, work requires the application of force, and force is the product of energy. Engineering, then, is all about energy, and it's worth noting that our contemporary understanding of energy was recent, was relatively recent, when Korzybski began his investigations in the early 20th century. And consider the fact that the pioneers of electrical research viewed electricity not as energy. And they're talking like Benjamin Franklin, for example. They, they saw it as a substance. In particular, they believed that it was a fluid. If that sounds far-fetched, think about all the times that we refer to electricity to this day as a flow and as current. It was only over the course of the 19th century that the modern concept of energy took hold and the laws of thermodynamics were formalized. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, Albert Einstein introduced his famous equation E equals mc squared. And that establishes that energy and matter are essentially equivalent. The third element in, the, in that equation, C, being the square of the speed of light, which is a measure of time. What all this represents is a paradigm shift to a view that the universe is essentially energy rather than essentially matter, and that matter is simply a very slow and stable form of energy. It's a shift away from viewing things as static and substantial and essentially timeless and towards viewing all phenomena as dynamic processes occurring in time. And it was a shift associated with the introduction of electric technologies, notably the telegraph, in the early 19th century. Now, Korzybski was a great admirer of Einstein, and in fact, called, Korzybski called his early work a general theory of time binding, imitating Einstein's general theory of relativity. And as an engineer working in the enthusiastic wake of a scientific revolution, Korzybski's theory of time binding was about energy. It begins with the sun as the source of energy for the earth and for all life on earth. And more than any other form of life, plants have evolved a way to capture and store that energy which is why he called plants the chemistry binding class of life. Now that stored energy is then used by animals who convert it into motion, which is to say kinetic energy, moving freely about in their environment in ways that plants are not capable of. And that's why he called animals the space binding class of life. Now as human beings, we're able to use that stored energy to move through space as well, but we've also found a way to store energy ourselves, not chemically, but in the form of knowledge, which makes us the time-binding class of life. This leads to a rather interesting economic commentary that can be found in Korzybski's first book, The Manhood of Humanity. And I'm going to read a quote to you. Korzybski writes, money is the measure and symbol of wealth, the product of time and toil, the crystallization of the time-binding human capacity. And this next part is written in all capital letters. So in other words, he's shouting. It is, tr it is thus true that money is a very precious thing, the measure and symbol of work, in part the work of the living, but in the main, the living work of the dead. Now, in Korzybski's analysis, wealth, and not just money and material goods, but also and especially knowledge and know-how, is a common human inheritance, which should be, in turn be utilized for the common good rather than for private gain. In remarking on the capitalist era, as he put it, he states that, and I quote again, it may seem strange, but it is true that the time-binding exponential powers called humans do not die. Their bodies die, but their achievements live forever, a permanent source of power. 
all of our precious possessions, science, acquired by experience, accumulated wealth in all fields of life, our kinetic and potential use values created and left by bygone generations. They are humanity's treasures produced mainly in the past and conserved for our use by that peculiar function or power of man for the binding of time. So what he's saying is essentially then every invention, every innovation, every human advancement is the product of generations, indeed millennia, of previous discoveries, tens of thousands of years of intellectual and physical labor. And so Korzybski comments, I quote again, this fact is of supreme ethical importance, applies to, us, to all of us. None of us may speak or act as if the material or spiritual wealth we have, we have were produced by us. For, and I love this, if we be not stupid, we must see what we call our wealth, our civilization, everything we use or enjoy in, is in, in the main the product of the labor of men now dead, some of them slaves, some of them owners of slaves. And then he goes on to pose the question, since the wealth of the world is in the main, the free gift of the past, the fruit of the labor of the dead, to whom does it of right belong? The question cannot be evaded. Is the existing monopoly of the great inherited treasures produced by dead men's toil a normal and natural evolution? Or is it an artificial status imposed by the few upon the many? Such is the crux of the modern controversy. He's writing this shortly after the Russian Revolution. And Korzybski's critique of capitalism and commercialism led him to argue that what we need is government based on scientific principles, a technocracy run by individuals involved in what he called human engineering and a society where everyone would employ a rational, scientific approach in every aspect of their lives. Now, from a contemporary perspective, this sounds at best naive and idealistic, may even sound a little ominous and threatening, but I think it's important to recall how differently we viewed science and technology, engineering and progress in the early 20th century. And Korzybski was not alone in his optimism. It was paralleled by that expressed by Thorsten Veblen in a book called The Engineers and the Price System, which was also published in 1921, and in Lewis Mumford's hopeful view of the transformative potential of electrification in his 1934 tome, Technics and Human Civilization. But politics aside, what is of great significance is that Korzybski differentiates between different types of time binding. He argues that human time binding mostly progresses slowly, arithmetically, if you like, except for the advancements made in science, technology, and engineering, where time binding becomes rapid and progress geometric. Upon further investigation, he came to understand that what sets human time binding apart from animal behavior so very dramatically was the human capacity for language and symbolic communication. Language is a storage medium, and the language that we speak is not our own invention, but the product of untold generations that have gone before us. It follows then that differences in the way that we use language can lead to differences in the process of time binding. Thus, Korzybski concludes that the ways in which scientists and engineers use language in their professional activities are much more effective than the imprecise and ambiguous way that language is used otherwise. Consequently, he developed general semantics as a means of extending the scientific approach to all communication and perception and evaluation, thereby improving, at least in theory, the efficiency of time binding and increasing the rate of progress in all areas of human activity. Now, I want to point out that Korzybski was, what led him to this is he was wounded as a Polish soldier serving in the Russian army during the First World War. And in that same war, Harold Innes was wounded 
as a Canadian soldier in the British Army. Korzybski went on to found the Institute of General Semantics in Chicago in 1938. Innes earned his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1920 and went on to teach at the University of Toronto where he became Canada's leading economist. He published several books on the subject of Canada's political economy during the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and didn't turn his attention to the study of communication until after the Second World War. It was not until 1950, the year that Korzybski died, that Innes published Empire and Communications, followed the next year by The Bias of Communication, and then by Changing Concepts of Time, published in 1952, the year that Innes died. And it was in the bias of communication in particular that Innes discussed the biases of time and space. The parallels are striking, but whereas Korzybski was concerned with the question of what distinguishes humanity from other forms of life, Innes was concerned with the question of what distinguishes one type of human society from another. And whereas Korzybski brought an engineer's concern with work and energy to the study of time, Innes brought an economist's concern with raw materials and staples. If time is energy to Korzybski, the media by which we communicate over time is akin to coal and oil for Innes. Korzybski studied time, and that led him to the study of communication. Innes studied communication, and that led him to the study of time. Communication, however, has typically been talked about in terms of transportation, transmission, or pipeline metaphors. It therefore represents a significant breakthrough on Innes's part to realize that communication can take place over time as well as over space. And James Carey called this the ritual view of communication, which stresses the role of communication in the formation and preservation of communities and nations, in the maintenance of social cohesion, cohesion and cultural continuity, in communing as opposed to commuting. In the process of binding time, we bind ourselves together in social units as families and tribes, communities and cities, nations and societies, and we bind ourselves together in this way. As we do that, we ourselves become bound by time, prisoners of our remembered past and our imagined future. Moreover, as the means by which we bind time changes, so too does the character of human culture. And this is central to Innes's insight, and it's part of a broader generalization that differences in the way that we communicate with others and with ourselves, differences in the way that we mediate between ourselves and our environment are differences that make a difference. They're differences that have a powerful influence on the way that we think and feel and perceive the world, on our consciousness, identity, and relationships, on our forms of social organization and our culture. And the bias of communication in a state, so I'm going to quote here, my bias is with the oral tradition, particularly as reflected in Greek civilization and with the necessity of recapturing something of its spirit. For that purpose, we should try to understand something of the importance of life or of the living tradition, which is peculiar to the oral as against the mechanized tradition. And Innes goes on to argue, I quote, the oral dialectic is overwhelmingly significant where the subject matter is human action and feeling, and it is important in the discovery of new truth, but of very little value in disseminating it. The oral discussion inherently involves personal contact and a consideration for the feelings of others. 